everyone. It's Ross Anderson here from Brave New World Wine in Sydney uh, with episode number eight of our Meet the Maker series. And it's a very special one today because it's International Pinotage Day. Um, and as always with these interviews, we hope to inform, entertain and educate you um, on give you a glimpse on what happens behind the scenes and with the amazing personalities behind the wines. Now, as I mentioned, it's International Pinotage Day today, uh, which is South Africa's unique contribution to the wine world. This variety has had a very interesting past and is now a key component in many South African winery offerings. Um, the vines were created uh, in 1925 uh, in Stellenbosch, and it's a crossing between Pinot Noir and Cinso, and the first wine was made in 1941. Now, today's guest heads up a cutting-edge operation that specialises in Chenin Blanc and Pinotage, with a few others on the side. Uh, but before we dial into Stellenbosch, I found this uh, really cool footage that I'd like to share with you. So have a look at this, and then we'll get straight into the interview. So there's some really amazing footage and it uh, really makes me quite homesick. It's been about 20 years since I last lived and worked in the Stellenbosch area, uh, but that's just beautiful. Now, joining us live, it's 9.30 a.m. in Stellenbosch uh, from Lavinia Wine Estate is uh, winemaker Dirk Kutsia. And we're just going to dial Dirk in right here. And there he is. Hey, Dirk, how are you, mate? Find yourself, Ross. Nice to be with you guys. Thank you for, for your time, and, and it's always a pleasure to be here with you. Absolutely. I'm sorry that we dragged you out of bed, or maybe you just did a, a, a straight one through the night last night to be joining us at breakfast. I'm hoping you've got a glass of something with your bacon and egg roll. Yeah, winemakers tend to, to start to drink quite early. Luckily, you know, farming, you normally stand up about... Uh, six o'clock and by seven o'clock you'll you'll be be going uh, and yes the, there's never a, a moment where you not try to convince somebody to drink something so we often start with mcc quite early in the morning so this is already quite late <laughs> let, let me tell you that's not just the south african thing we do it over here as well absolutely hey um so Dirk, it's International Pinotage Day, and we're really pleased to have you guys uh, involved and joining us today. Uh, what's going to happen at the farm today? Is there something special with uh, Pinotage going on? Yeah, definitely. Every farm or every institute, uh, estate will have a, a, a nice offering for, for guests coming, especially from, from Cape Town area. Uh, they'll come and visit our properties, and we'll have some special wines that we share with them. Uh, today, we're definitely showing the versatility of Pinotage, like we always like to do with Lavinia, but also really showing people uh, the aging ability of this uh, proudly South African grape. So we'll be showcasing not just MCCs, uh, rosés, but also all the vintages of Pinotage, and they will definitely pair, be paired with South African food, like you always know. We like to eat and drink, so that's part of our culture. I wish I was there to join you. But uh, Dirk, uh, getting on to some questions, uh, what, how are things in Stellenbosch and at Lavinia at the moment? I mean, what kind of an impact did COVID have uh, during the lockdown on your operation? Uh, and did you use that time to do anything different or, or start some new projects at all? 
Yeah, so they always say when, when times are tough, uh, innovation definitely kicks in. And this is something that we've noticed in our industry, but also for Lavinia. Um, you know, these routes of sales that you normally tend to almost forgot about, uh, you definitely went and had a really in-depth look into them. Uh, so things like wine online sales just boomed. Uh, we know that this is the way that we can broadcast. This is the way that we can sell. But also, we tend to uh, go into a phase where we really feel that we want to take the brand to the people, into their homes. So you can imagine anything like Zoom meetings, webinars. Uh, two days ago, I had a steak 12 o'clock at night with people in Florida. So there's things that you do. You really want to take um, the wine to the people because they're not able sometimes to come onto your estate. We've also seen some great innovations coming from um, the, the, the bigger institutes like uh, your um, like your Stellenbosch Wine Route. Uh, they've established something to kickstart the restaurants in town in Stellenbosch, uh, like a bit of a voucher. Uh, we, when you go and dine, you get 300 grand voucher. This voucher you can use for your next dinner. Uh, and, in, and only in the Stellenbosch area. So in that way, they activate people to come out, to come and wine and dine again, uh, to buy wine, buy food, and, and really kickstart the industry again. So a lot of great innovations coming from this uh, quite unknown uh, times that we find ourselves in. Yeah, that's true. And now that the, uh, the restrictions have eased, What's the feeling like? What, what are you feeling in the industry itself? What's the story going on between the producers uh, and the consumers? Is there confidence returning or is it still early days? Yeah, you know, we, we in, in tough times like this, we know we need to pull together. We need to become a, a nation like, like no other time again. And uh, when it's either when it's in the restaurant business or in the wine business, the same goes for it. So we tend to try to rely on brand loyalty. It's something that we work quite uh, intensely on. So keeping that communication with your current consumer uh, and you want that consumer to really come back, uh, be loyal to the brand and purchase now that we're free and open to, to, to sell wine again. So we've seen great brand loyalty and we hope that the, the new customers that we've made over this really tough time that also will also become quite loyal uh, and support the brand. And I think the same goes for, for many of the brands in, in Stellenbosch. Because it's very boutique-ish, uh, the wineries are, are very brand-related. Um, and this is why we, you need to really last on that uh, relationship with, with your customers. So while you were chatting there, I grabbed a bottle of one of my favorite wines. I'm not just saying that because you're here, but... Uh, just hold that up to the camera. This is the Lavinia uh, single block uh, Pinotage uh, from 2017. And uh, I thought, why not? It's uh, Pinotage Day. Let's rock it. And um, I think this wine is almost nearly sold out. So uh, there, there's a really good indication of how it's been uh, perceived here. And uh, when, we, when we meet with um, uh, people in the trade and the consumers, uh, they always say, what's it like? And we, we kind of, well, you know, it, it's really hard because there's so many styles made of this wine now. Uh, tell us a little bit about your style in making Pinotage. You're, you're a little bit more traditional uh, in your approach. Would, would that be right? Yeah, so definitely when you look at the, the single block Pinotage, it's, it's an iconic wine on the farm. It's made from one specific block. Uh, and seeing that Lavinia is known for specialization in Pinotage, Ten years ago, I realized that this specific block gives me different fruit from all the others, much more concentrated, much smaller berries, um, and just a, a wine that I know that will have the ability to age. The beauty of when you're working with Pinotage, you're working with a varietal with, with beautiful tannin structure, um, and when you pour it into your glass, I'm also going to have a bit of it while we're speaking, uh, you can see that beautiful ruby red, almost a purple color. And that's the, the, the main thing about, uh, about uh, Pinotage is that it's got this beautiful color, firm tannin structure. And this is something that, that we quite love uh, when it comes to Pinotage. So this wine, 
Um, it's made in a more of a, I would say, a uh, modernized top-end pinotage. It's got a lot of tannin, but the tannins are very much refined. You know, they, they're not harsh. Um, and the beauty of this specific wine is that it's got the ability to age forever. I always say pinotage is like an elephant. It, it will just keep on running. I promise you, you can open up this bottle um, 10, 15 years later, and it will show like it's been bottled yesterday. The color will be magnificent. The wine will be fresh. Um, I opened up a bottle of uh, 1994 the other day, and my guest said, Dirk, what are you doing? I said, what did I do wrong? You know, is the wine not good? What's, what's, what's happening? So no, please just, just, just promise me you don't open up any of these bottles for the next 10 years. So again, just showing you that this rital that we've got, that we call our own, has definitely royalty in the sense that it can age. And this is the style that this wine is made in. So it's, it's fuller style. It's a modernized pinotage, small scale connoisseur's product, only 5,000 bottles a year. Um, and it's a beautiful wine for, for those connoisseurs around the country and also in foreign countries. So it's on allocation. You can't get hold of this wine if you're not allocated. So it's one of those really prestigious pinotages coming from a beautiful, beautiful ridge of decomposed shell. And this is actually where we grow this wine or where we slot into with our grapes. You can see the soil type uh, and that's the mother substrate and it gives us beautiful fruit intensity. This is what we get from the specific soil type. It's called shale. So this is the mother substrate. Cheers. So if you're making if you're making a cheers, cheers. Thanks for joining us. Um, if you're making five thousand bottles a year, how 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 big is the how big is the vineyard? Uh, what's what's that output there? What, where are you cropping it at? Oh, so the vineyard is one point two hectares big. So I've got the ability to do about uh, thirteen thousand bottles, but we do a lot of selection. So first of all, we select the best bunches in the in the vineyard itself. It will go through selection and sorting in the winery itself, and then it will go into barrique. And it spends about 18 to 24 months in barrel. And throughout the course of this wine's life, uh, we'll taste it. And at the end of the day, we'll choose the best 10 to 12 or 13 barrels for this specific wine. I want the best to go into this bottle. I want the best of this specific site. So I always tell people, you know what? I want you to get into my ute, or we call it a bucky, and I want to drive you up <laughs> on top of the hill, but I want you to feel, feel the maritime influence, you know? It's a beautiful sight itself. And I'm assuming you take the same approach to the single block Shannon, so you just want the best fruit and it's coming from a certain parcel and a certain area on the farm? Yeah, the same goes with the Shen and Blunt. So we've uh, allocated two blocks, one for the Pinotage on top of the hill, block number two. And then down on the farm or closer to the farmstead, there's a block which is 47 years old. We call her the old lady. Uh, she's very special to us. Uh, it's Shen and Blanc. And um, it's one of the ODPs, Old Vine Project uh, vineyards registered. And with this vine, just like with the Pinotage, it's never been irrigated. It's old vines, they know how to distribute their carbon, they're very much in balance. And this balance you can really pick up in the wines themselves. So with this specific Chenin Blanc, the single block Chenin Blanc, uh, which stands just next to the single block Pinotage, uh, you can definitely feel age and you can feel maturity and you can feel elegance when you taste the wines. And so I'm just a little bit curious to keep on this topic. Uh, so you've got a single block for some Pinotage, a single block for some Shannon. Have you got any other little projects that you're working on that's going to be like a single block of something? Or, or is this where you sit at the moment? Yeah, yeah so, you know, me being, uh, I, I look a bit old, but actually I'm still young. So <laughs> for me, it's always a, a matter of experimentation. Um, it's something that we exchange with our fellow uh, Frenchmen that were in, working for the same company. And sometimes you get back home and you, you inspire again. And uh, definitely we're looking into being very holistic, being very green in the way that we farm Lavinia, but also to, to generate more products. Something that, that I've got in mind at the moment is a nice Cape blend. 
You know, we're talking Pinotage, we're talking Lavinia, so we need to do a beautiful blend, a K blend, so that's something that I'm looking into. And also, we're planting a lot of bush wine at the moment. So bush wine has shown over the years that it's really, really spectacular in the fact that it's lower crop, more intensity. Um, and my idea, I can't really give you all my ideas because then I'm giving away some of my, um, some of my cards that I need to keep on my chest. But yeah, we're thinking into making even a more special uh, wine um, that will be in the same same level or range than the single block. So always looking for those specific sites uh, and way of growing um, to interfere to a certain extent with the final product that you that you're thinking about. Sure, sounds great. And just while we were opening this, uh, it came to mind to me today earlier on um, that. Normally, today being Saturday the 10th of October, we would be doing a massive Pinot Noir Festival in Sydney, which uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of the brand. I think they're trying to get an exposure into Cape Town where it's a Pinot Palooza, and uh, they do a, a circuit of Pinot Noir shows all the way through Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Singapore, uh, getting into the US, and they were really pushing hard to uh, to get something to Cape Town. and. Uh, we took a lot of Pinotage along to that festival. Uh, we, we spoke to the organiser and he said, you know, it's Pinot Palooza, we can bring Pinotage. And he went, yeah, why not? And we were pushing Pinotage like you can't believe to Australian consumers at a Pinot Noir festival. And they were buying it and they loved it. Uh, but I just wanted to say a big shout out to Dan Sims and the Revel team in Melbourne. I hope you guys are watching and uh, we'll hope to see you on the road next year for Pinot Palooza. And then... I don't know if you can see the comments there uh, on the bottom of the screen, but we've got a message from uh, Bernard at uh, Chamonix saying how much he loves your uh, your uh, single block uh, pinotage. So thanks for joining us, Bernard. But let, let's get back to uh, let's get back to you, Dirk. Tell us a bit about your story. Um, I, I was saying earlier on we, we got a little bit of crossover. You were you were born or you come from George on the on the beautiful garden route, and I spent uh, some of my formative years growing up in Mossel Bay. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if we cross paths on the sports fields at all. Um, I was at Point High and uh, in Mossel Bay, but there you go. Um, how did you catch the wine bug? Is what I really want to know. Yeah, so growing up in, a, in an area like the Garden Route, you're very close to nature. And um, I actually grew up uh, born born in George, like you just mentioned. Uh, and then I grew up in the Nisner Forest between Wilderness and Nisner, but up way into the into the forest itself i grew up on a farm so farming was always part of my gene i would say uh, and then also my father you know he introduced me to, to top wines uh, he was a wine connoisseur so we drank a lot of great wines at home um, and being part of that area the nature the farming father introducing you to wine uh, i really caught some interest in in this uh, in this industry but also, I always say, you know, I, I like the art form of wine. Uh, I would have loved to be able to play instrument or to do great uh, sketching or whatever the case might be. I love art. Um, so this is my form of art, I always say, that I can give to people. You know, I want to take the best that I can get from a specific terroir. I want to put it in a bottle and I want people... We, and here at Love and Here, we don't talk about a product. We talk about a piece of art. So this artwork that we give to people, we want to see them enjoy it, like they would enjoy music or art or an art gallery to go and go and see stuff. So um, for me, yeah, it's it's always been part of me. And then also friends, you know, friends always uh, tend to play a big role of of where you're going and, and where you're leading into your life. So. One should never forget about the, the influence that, that that friends have on you. And uh, I've got very good friends that grew up with me, uh, also in, in wilderness. Uh, and some of them are also winemakers today. So we've walked a path. Uh, and with the new friends that I've made at Stellenbosch University. And, and all of a sudden, you just find yourself going into the direction uh, where, you're, where you want to head to a certain extent. And so I don't often ask this of people, but I'd be keen to know because you've, you've just twigged it. If you weren't a winemaker, what would you like to be? What would you have been? Oh, yes, sir. I would have loved to be a game ranger. I've uh, got a big, big, big love for, for wild animals. Um, 
And at one stage, I really felt that I wanted to, to become a marine biologist. That was my first thought, then a game ranger. Um, and then my first love, you know, winemaking. So it was really difficult to decide. But at the end of the day, I, I knew that, you know, farming was, it, it will definitely take over my life. And it's definitely taken it over. But uh, the love for nature, I think a game ranger or marine biologist, if I had to, to make a call. Yeah, I, I was supposed to be a military pilot uh, or a rock guitarist or something like that. And I'm in wine, so there you go. But anyway, but Dirk, you um, you joined Love in the Air in uh, 2007. Uh, where were you working before that? Yeah, I have to be honest, I was still studying before 2007. I was, uh, I was a student before that. So still enjoying life as a student uh, in the Stellenbosch area. I studied at the University of Stellenbosch, just down the road. And um, then after, after that, I went abroad for two years. So I spent some time in Australia, America, back to Australia. And then I came back to Lavinia, where I used to work as a student. So I knew the farm before I really came back to, to settle in, in South Africa. You just touched on Australia there. Now, um, I know that you worked at Zilzi, and uh, we, were, we were discussing just slightly earlier on that you worked at, uh, was it Cape Jaffa? Um, in, was it Robe? Yeah, that's correct. And then you went and you joined the crazy gang at Darenberg Wines in McLaren Vale, um, who I know, I know really well. They're amazing people, amazing winemakers. Um, Chester in particular has got some amazing art form and uh, an amazing character. I'd be really keen to know what was the craziest thing you ever saw Chester do or wear? Yes, so there's there's been a, a few of them here. Like we all know, Chester Osborne is, is, is just out there, you know, um, always very innovative, uh, very creative with, with all his styles of not just his, his, his wear that he wears every day, but the way that they go about at Darenberg are, are quite spectacular and quite unique. Uh, I remember those open ferments uh, where we had 40, um, 40 young students coming in and you literally got a like a suit where you had to do food trading, you know. Uh, taking out that juice, getting into that big fermenter, and most of these guys, they were backpackers, so all day long, they'll be food treading. Uh, and then those fermenters where it was literally, I think it was big pipes, which they took, and they cut off the sides, and they gave it a top, uh, and uh, that was open fermenters or fermenters that they, they ferment in. So the, the amount of stuff, I worked on a, on a basket press, which was 180 years old, um, everything at Darenberg gets pressed in a basket press. So you can imagine doing 3,000 tons of grapes and you're doing it in basket press, five ton, you know, in a basket press you can maybe fit two tons, the amount of press that you need to do. But this is a way that he thought, this is what, what makes him unique. Uh, look at that beautiful tasting room that they've just done, the cube, uh, in the middle of that, that vineyard. Uh, it's just spectacular, you know, and it, and it creates interest. Uh, his wines are, are very well made wines, uh, very well thought through. Uh, and it was quite an experience, I must say. Some of those techniques got back home and really uh, tried to implement them into what I do today. And if they work, you can make them part of the protocol. If not, uh, you have to stick with what you know. So, yeah, it was a great experience working for for, for Peter. I remember him walking into a tasting in Sydney a couple of years ago and he bought a white suit, a full white suit, and then he'd laid it out on the parking lot and got a whole lot of spray paint cans and he'd spray painted and graffitied the suit and then he put it on and he went to the formal tasting. <laughs> yeah, oh, anyway. Oh, that's just at his best. At his best. Yeah, it's, it's, it's always great being being out at night with Chester. It's, it's, got, it's got always something up his sleeve, so it's... It was a great experience. So tell me, Lavinia has got quite a history. Uh, it's been a working farm since the late 1600s, and it was named Lavinia in 1992 when it changed ownership. Um, when were the first vines planted, 
And, and when was the decision made to really push and specialize in Pinotage and Shannon? Yeah, so the farm, like you just mentioned, it, it was one of the first farms, or it was the first farm outside of Constantia. And like you all know, Constantia is the oldest AOC in the country. And then after that, you've got Stellenbosch. So Stellenbosch, uh, with Lavinia, at that stage, it was called Weltefrieden, which is quite Dutch. And uh, Weltefrieden was the first estate or farm to grow vineyards. So that tells us that we've been farming with grapes for more than 300 years. Um, so the experience is definitely here. But in 1990, a French Mauritian guy called Marc Vier, he bought the farm and he met up with uh, ex-chemist Franch and that will most probably, we need to touch on to Franch and because I have to tell you a little bit about him. But Franch met with Marc, um, the sugarcane farmer that bought this farm and um, they established what we've got today or most of it you know the the salad was built by Francois and Mark and in 1992 the first wine was actually made in the room that I'm sleeping today which used to be a garage so the first wine was actually made in 1992 in my garage or my room today and then after that they built the the cellar itself uh, but I must say uh, Francois and, and Mark really took Lavinia and they put Lavinia on the map for the first time if it comes to, to Pinotage and Shannon. But I think specialization definitely came in um, in 2013 when Advini took over. They asked me, Dirk, okay, what's your thoughts? What, what do you want to do with Lavinia? What, where, where do you want to be heading with it? And, and I've got the saying, you know, you, you can't be a jack of all trade master of none. I want people when they walk in Stellenbosch or in New York or wherever, and they tell people, you know what, I want to taste the best Chenin Blanc and Pinotage. Where should I go? I'm visiting uh, Stellenbosch next month. They should say Lavinia. Okay, so you need to be known for something. And specialization definitely came in. So we've uh, noticed or we've allocated or registered certain blocks for the top icon wines. Um, and we're spending a lot of money if it comes to Pinotage and Chenin Blanc. We didn't choose these two varieties because they probably South African and Shannon has been with us forever. We chose these two varieties because they fit with our substrate. And our substrate at Lavinia is the soil. Okay, and if you know the genes of, of Lavinia, it's definitely farming. And where the source is, is where you start. And we started with what really fits our climate, our terroir. And it was Pinotage and Shannon. So when you stand on top of the hill, you can really feel, you know what, this is a proudly South African area. This is proudly South African in the sense that it's Pinotage and Shannon Blanc country. Fantastic. And you do a great job at it as, as you've experienced and, and, and experimented in the quality of your products. Um, so while we're on that, with, with your travel and your international experience in making wine in America and in Australia, uh, etc. What do you believe are the similarities and then the differences between South African and other regions of the world in, in the in the flavor profiles and in, in the approach to winemaking? Is there anything that really comes to mind? I mean, to qualify uh, uh, what I'm meaning is uh, when I open a bottle of South African wine, I, there's something in it that I can tell it's from Africa. It's, I always call it, I can taste the earth, I can taste the soil, I can smell the soil. And, and I never find that in Australian wines, I find something different there, but South Africa always has this DNA. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's true. Uh, looking at similarities, we can always say, you know what, we can speak the same language, English. Uh, although we speak Afrikaans uh, during the day, we, we, we've got the same language uh, to a certain extent. And I think temperature-wise, I think um, Australia really meets up with South Africa if it comes to our climatic um, areas and also something similar you also have your desert you also have your tropical forest so in that sense uh, we, we we can say it's similar but then again um, we love the differences be between countries we we love to experience the difference because this is why you travel this is why you're going to experience this is why we exchange so for us we always when we travel we want to search for the difference and there's definitely big differences if you look at cultures we're different from you guys. Uh, one big difference is we know how to play rugby. I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, hang on. But, uh, I'm, I'm still, I've still yeah, got so, green blood, yeah? 
I'm still a springbok. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> just a joke, eh? Just a joke. But yeah, well, we, I'm happy we, with it. We, <laughs> that's also similarity. We like it. <laughs> no, but the, I, I think the difference is definitely when you in South Africa, and uh, we've just spoke about it, you sit with the industry older than 300 years. So the experience, if it comes to winemaking, it's it's quite long. Um, and our, I would say our area is built on really ancient soils. Now, this is something very spectacular to Africa itself. And it's it's interesting that you find that when you taste South African wines, you can really pick up our beautiful soils. I always say when you get off the airport, whether it's in Johannesburg or in Cape Town, and you get off the airplane and you've been away for a while and you can smell Africa, it's like, yeah, I'm back at home. So we're farming with ancient soils, very diverse soils, um, formed early in the, in the Ice Age. So Africa was the first continent to be exposed. So we're sitting with soils sometimes 400 million years older than what you will find in Europe. So we can really be biased if it comes to our soils. And that's, I always say, our soils are as diverse as our cultures in South Africa. Uh, and this is something that we slot into. Um, and then the beauty of our big mountains and our topography. I think the topography in our wine area is massive. You know, I've traveled the world quite a lot. Uh, I've experienced quite a lot of the world. And I must say, if you take Stellenbosch, as a as a uh, as an ASC, the amount of influence that we get from our big oceans, uh, but not just the oceans, also the topography. You've got the big Simonsburg Mountain that we're farming on. Other oaks are farming in the Yonkertrick Valley, uh, and once you year, you really experience these massive mountains, and you can imagine the influence, the ma uh, the amount of overshadowing, the amount of erosion, of pressure, etc that these mountains play in terms of smaller microclimates. And for that reason, it's very different uh, from a lot of the, the other wine areas in the world. Um, I experienced this topography in, in New Zealand, but uh, for the rest, you know, you always have to come back home to experience proper topography, massive mountains, big oceans, and that's, that's something quite unique to, the, to this area. And then we've got animals. We've got great animals, we've got the bush valve, we've got deserts, we've got tropical forests, whatever your heart desires. And that's the amazing thing about, about South Africa, is the uh, food, wine, topography experience. It's all there, and you, you, uh, you sell it really well because uh, it, it's just sensational, it's really beautiful. But uh, now, tell us who the Pope of Pinotage is. And, and what the influence the Pope has had on, on not only at Lavanier but on Pinotage as a variety. Um, sorry, you have to repeat that. Sorry, uh, Ross. Uh, repeat just, just... Uh, well, I was saying, tell us who the Pope of Pinotage is and what his influence was uh, not just at Lavanier but on Pinotage as a variety. Yeah, the Pope of Pinotage is definitely uh, Mr. Francio Nodier, um, superhuman being, you know, down to earth guy. Uh, he always wanted to have a glass of wine with you, always have an experience. And um, he just did so much, so much groundwork if it comes to, to Pinotage itself. Not just him, but also some of his other fellow, I would say, age uh, group. Um, they took this unknown variety. Uh, and they did a lot of experimentation on this. They needed to create a new protocol, a way of working with a grape that nobody knew. You know, we've only done 60 harvests. And all of a sudden, you get guys like Franz and that they've got this new varietal, South African, uh, that ripens much faster than other varietals. It's an early varietal. It's not like Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and it ferments quite quickly. So all of a sudden, you need to do your groundwork and uh, Francia really did amazing work for, for Pinotage and exploring and, and really delving in there to understand the variety uh, and the beauty of Francia uh, and this is actually why we call him the Pope to a certain extent too is that he likes to share. He likes to share his knowledge with a new generation like myself and, and the rest of the younger generation um, and to share that knowledge uh, in order for us to have a nice basis to work from. 
And I always say the new generation like us, we're yet to tweak this varietal. Okay, so the hard work has really been done by Franchi and Adia and Bayer Streeter and these guys. Uh, we're here to tweak the varietal. We're here to explore new styles. Uh, and we're here to tell you guys and broadcast, you know what, you, we've got something special in the bottle here uh, and special that we do in South Africa. Absolutely. And, and on the whole varietal thing, is there a variety besides Pinotage and Shannon that you would really love to work with in the future? That you see as has great potential in your area, or or not in your area, but uh, you know, is there something that's yeah, really I've I've always your interest? Uh, yeah, I've, I've I've always thought about it. Um, you know, when you work with Pinotage, uh, it's very particular uh, for certain reasons, and I think Pinot Noir is very, very much similar to in, in that sense. Uh, we all know that everybody can make Pinot Noir, but to make a good Pinot Noir takes a lot. Uh, there's a fine line between over extraction, too much oak, and something which is too thin. Uh, so really to get the balance if we're talking Pinot Noir, and this is why I would like to work with the grape like Pinot Noir maybe uh, in some other time in my life where I really, I always have this thing about Pinotage and Pinot Noir being very similar. I always say when you're walking a mountain and there's no track and the trail is tough, it's so much, so much more rewarding when you get to that summit. It's the same when you do a great pinotage or a great pinot noir. And I think this is why, because it will be such a challenge to work with this grape uh, pinot noir. So definitely, I think if I have to work with another grape, uh, it will be pinot noir. Um, and then, you know, always the royal stuff, the cabernets and the stuff are, are never way too, too far away from, 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 my, from my list of, of, of wanting to. Um, so on, on that, tell us a little bit about your future plans, if you, if you are able to share any of them. Um, any future aspirations for the brand? Anything that, uh, I mean, you said that there's a couple of projects going on with the single blocks and you, you're keeping those cards close to your chest, but is there any other, any other interesting or exciting developments that are going to happen um, in the near future? Yeah, if you look... If you look at the mother holding company at Vinny, um, we've got more than 2,000 hectares in, in France and 1,700 of them are being farmed organic. Uh, it's something that I'm looking intensively into, um, changing for now certain portions of the, of the, of the farm into organics. Uh, but also, it's, for me, it's got to do with thinking holistically. Uh, whatever I farm with today, um, whatever I leave for the next generation needs to be alive, needs to be taken care of. Um, and I want to really think holistic. And this is the way that we think at Lavinia, but I really want to specialize even more into that and get into more depth if it comes to thinking holistic for the farm itself, for the way that we farm, but also for, for other various reasons, you know, the brand, the pinotage, what are we going to do with it further? And I think it's still only early days. So there's a lot of scope for, for pinotage. But I think my mindset at the moment is really focusing holistic green, uh, being really true to your terroir, but also preserving what you've got for the next uh, follow-up or generation that follow. Fantastic. And, and whilst we're talking about future generations, let's look at some past thoughts and past memories. Can you tell us what your favorite wine memory is? Or one of them? Sure. Uh, that's that's quite a, a difficult question. If you've got so, so many nice wineries uh, in South Africa, I tend to like wineries like Sebastian Beaumont. Uh, makes very good wine. Um, I like brands like Kleiner Zalder, who does exceptionally well brand-wise, but also quality-wise. Uh, you always have fellow neighbors that you tend to, to like. Um, so, yeah, yes, so it's, it's, it's very difficult to say which one. I enjoy Derenberg's wines, to be honest. Uh, but I also enjoy the, the wines coming from the Adelaide Hills. For me, there's a finesse to that area. Uh, there's a very beautiful charm to the wines that the Adelaide Hills does. So that, that area is really special for me. But um, I always say, you know what, there's so many great wines around the world. I can tell you now that I, I like Gazier in the Provence or I like Capigier in, 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 in Bordeaux. But 
at the end of the day, well-made wine is well-made wine. So you tend to get well-made wine across the globe. And uh, uh, I just really enjoy good, good made wine. It, it sounds to me like you have uh, a soft spot for Australia. Uh, have you got any travel plans coming up for any time soon? I mean, when once we can travel again, uh, any any plans on coming back over to this side of the world? Yeah, I would love to. My wife actually travelled to Australia last year, and uh, it was a pity, but I had to go to Europe at that stage. So otherwise, I would have loved to uh, to do a trip to Australia again. Uh, I would like to go and say hello again to everybody that I spend a lot of time with, and um, yeah, just to experience Australia again. The the beauty of Australia is uh, humongous, and um, like all know, the landscape is massive. So when you go to Australia, you need to be able to travel long distances. But still, you know, the, the beauty of the country is, is, is great. And yes, so I had so many great experiences going down the, um, going down the, the coast, the southern coast, uh, Great Ocean Road, surfing, and, uh, yeah. doing it from Brisbane to Sydney in a, in a motorhome. And uh, yeah, we've, we've had plenty of great experiences up in Ayers Rock. That sounds awesome. Um, now... Apart from your love of wine and your love of art and nature, you have a deep love for music. What are you listening to at the moment? Yeah, I love music. Um, like I just mentioned, you know, I would have loved to be able to play instrument. But yeah, uh, music is so it's so broad. You know, things like Coldplay, which is so established and and always changing the way that they. They perform, uh, and the genre is always amazing for me about Coldplay. So they're definitely on top of my list. And when I feel like I want to go back uh, 20 or 30 years ago when I grew up with with mom and dad, I always say I like to listen to a bit of Bruce Springsteen, Rodriguez, Cold Fact, Dire Straits, you know, those, those old golden area, I would say, great lyrics and, and great music. Um, You're a classic and then rocker. Local music, you know, I'm a big supporter of our local, local music. Uh, anything from rap uh, going through to, to really great lyrics coming from guys like Yushan Adirian or Spuchwolf or whatever the case might be. So, yeah, we've got very, very good artists in South Africa at the moment doing very well for themselves and uh, we're supporting them all the way. So, yeah, definitely. Uh, Afrikaans music, but South African music, always fond of it too. <laughs> What's that band? Um, uh, I saw them at uh, Kirstenbosch Gardens uh, at that summer concert series. They were, they're quite big in South Africa. Um, it's not uh, Prime Circle, it's another one that's sort of affiliated or, or, or similar genre. Um, name escapes me now. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll leave that one for another day. But... Um, Let's just get back to uh, questions here yeah. about <laughs> about post COVID. What do you see as the new normal for South African wineries when once we find a vaccination? Do you think its business will return to a form of normality, or there's going to be sort of some of the old and a lot of the new? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we all know at the moment it's so uncertain whether we're going to turn back to the norm that we used to know. It's, it's always a big question, I think, for anybody at the moment. But what I definitely can say, and I want to add to what you just said, uh, I think whatever we've built in this tough time, whatever new innovation we've made part of our businesses, I hope that these uh, things can last or these routes of sales can last and interaction can last. Uh, and yes, we might head back into a norming phase, but uh, we need to try and work on this new route of sales and new way of, of, of thought uh, and not forget about it, but make it part of the business going forward. Whether we're going to be back into a norm, I don't really know. You know, We know that for South Africa at the moment, uh, we can see that on weekends we're totally packed, we're full if it comes to amount of visitors to the farm. Because it's South African visitors, it's local visitors at the moment. Uh, they work during the weeks and on, 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 on weekends they want to go out and, and have a glass of wine on a wine farm. So how do we tap into our local market again? How do we revive that to such a certain extent that we get as plenty as possible 
locals coming to visit? Uh, and how do we replace the foreign visitors that we used to have during the week on the farm? How do we take care of these days, you know? Uh, do we need to tell ourselves, listen here, from Monday to Tuesday and Wednesday, we're going to do just Zoom meetings with our foreign guests to get them to feel the interaction, uh, to be interactive with, with your market. Uh, we're in a phase where we have to take our brand to the people, you know, especially if we're talking foreign guests. We have to take it to them. We know that at the moment, Norm might take, a half a year, a year, maybe three years. We never know. You know, it's so uncertain. Uh, but we need to take our brands there and build loyalty and build relationship. So one last question before I let you get on with the rest of your day. Um, Love and Years kind of describes itself as a boutique operation. Uh, how, how many tons do you crush per annum? And how much of that is sold domestically and how much is, of that is exported? Yeah, so for Lavinia, we uh, we export about 45% 40, of our produce um, and the rest are all local sales. So you can imagine with, um, um, I'm not trying to be pessimistic, you can imagine with the industry like the restaurant business where Lavinia is very strong, on trade especially, um, you've, you've lost about 30% of, of that industry and all of a sudden uh, you need to create sales from other sources and other other routes. And um, yeah, so stay close to the restauranteurs, form relationships with them, um, try and build something uh, new, uh, be innovative. Uh, and that's something that the South African wine industry has always been very uh, good at. And and South Africans in general, if, if tough times hit, we've got the ability to adapt uh, and to be innovative uh, and to last. And at the end of the day, we need to think long term. Uh, let's get over this little bump, and uh, so that with with our hands almost tucked in together, uh, and tomorrow might be uh, a better day. So it's uh, just one of those things. Uh, don't stop uh, with making great wines. Uh, don't harm your brand. Be very careful. Don't harm your brand. Uh, stick with your guns. Um, I believe that the tide will, will turn, and I hope really that the tide will turn for not just the wine business, but also for the restaurant and for um, our um, foreigners coming into South Africa. Absolutely. Dirk, the band was the Parlor Tones that we saw at uh, Kirstenbosch. Uh, that's one of the, those bands that I absolutely love coming out of South Africa, so um, I, I know that you probably know who they are. And um, on that note, I'm going to let you get on with your Saturday morning, uh, get back to work, get selling Pinotage by the dozens. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, from Stellenbosch on the special day. Uh, stay safe, and we hope to be in touch with you again soon. Thank you very much, guys. Keep on drinking Pinotage and stay supportive thank of you, the South Dirk. African wine. All good. Stay on the line yeah, for me, Dirk. Pleasure. Thank you very much. And that's it for this episode, everyone. So thank you for uh, dialing in and joining pleasure, us. Pleasure, and uh, we hope to see you again online soon. Take care.